until the end of the lecture, please. And uh, as I said, just keep the lectures to the end. There's a donation box at the back of the hall if anybody wants to make a donation to the start of the Was that for your car next Some say he should have brought a bottle of whiskey with him tonight. Yeah. I think it was the least he could have done. Yeah. Yeah. However, we can forgive him because he, he did. Because Nas here is a very good friend of this society, last Fallon, a very good friend of mine. And Dublin Four Brigade and the Irish Revolution. That's his name on the book there, Laz. And if anybody who's interested in purchasing that, you can purchase that here in the library. There's a wonderful publication about that tumultuous time in Irish history. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll present to you Laz, as I said, pit me lots of water here. Unfortunately, there's no whiskey here. <laughs> but this man here, he put the spice in the well. Thanks very much, Ken. Thank you. And it's, it is, it's a great day to be back here again and to, to work with yourselves. The Liberty's Whiskey Fire. We're here this evening to hear the story of a piece of largely forgotten Dublin history, and it seems forgotten in this city of song and story and heroes of renown. But this one has been overlooked and forgotten, and this evening we cast a light on it. The fire on the 18th of June 1875 at Malone's Bonded Warehouse was the largest in Dublin in the 19th century in terms of property damage and financial loss, and also in terms of lives lost. We'll have a look at the story behind it here this evening. The main player in the drama was the Dublin Fire Brigade, and it's worth having a look at that organisation before we go further. The Dublin Fire Brigade had been founded as a municipal fire service for Dublin Corporation in 1862. There had been a fire service in the city since the corporation had first bought fire engines, which were then very sensibly called water engines at that time, in 1711. As the years went by, the city's efforts were overshadowed by those of the Church of Ireland, who were required by law from 1715 to maintain a large and a small fire engine in each parish in the city. The parish pumps from that period can still be seen in St. Werbrook's Church, and they may well be the oldest preserved fire engines in Ireland. I don't know if anyone has seen them. If you get a chance to go in, it's worth, well worth having a look. This would be the type of engine that's in uh, Werbrook's Church and would have been the type of engine going back to 1715 that would have been available. That particular one is a Newsham model made in London. In its day, it would have been very much uh, the, the kind of Rolls Royce of fire engines. Again, a slightly smaller version of one, which uh, again you'll see very, very similar in uh, in, in Burbank's Church. From the 1720s, the new English idea of fire insurance companies came to Dublin with the first the Royal Exchange Insurance setting up here in 1724, just two years after being established in London. After the Great Fire of London, uh, a lot of merchants were wiped out financially, a lot of the killed houses were wiped out. And the idea of fire insurance came in as, in, it, I'll be enough worse, but it's a, a new idea to them at the time, where you would set a value on your property in your house, and you would pay the insurance company a premium, and in return, should the house burn down, they would pay you the agreed value. So, the insurance companies then had a very good reason to have effective firefighting measures put in place. So the first professional firefighters were actually the insurance company brigades. And oddly enough, a service that we look at now as being the ultimate public service, where anybody can pick up a phone, dial 999, 112, and whatever resources you require will be sent to you, in its early days was a service specifically for the wealthy and for those who could afford it. If you couldn't afford it, relied on the parish pumps. Now the parish pumps, their system was totally different. Uh, the beadle, the, the clerk of the parish, had control of the fire engines as part of his duties. Uh, there was a monetary value to that, in that if you were the first fire engine on scene, there was a bounty paid to you, and the second one had another bounty, the third one had a bounty. So there was money to be made. And because of that, the position of beadle was one that people tried to, to get. It was, it was a, a job that had, had access to money. And certainly in England, they'd always say that, you know, the term parish pump politics, which we think of as an Irish term, 
is uh, actually related to that, to the early days of firefighting. That the parish pump, the, the, the Beatles, um, maneuvering to be in charge of the fire engines was the original parish pump politics. As I said, in the 1720s, the first insurance company to set up in Dublin, the Royal Exchange, arrived. Um, they insured property against fire in return for an annual premium, not having a high regard in parish pump brigades, they set up their own brigades, or as they called them again, like water engines, the, ter the terminology has changed over the years, uh, they were called fire engine establishments. It's a lovely name, much nicer than fire brigades. These were only available to their customers. Now, insured properties were marked with fire marks to indicate that they could call on the relevant fire office to deal with any fire. This would be an insurance fireman's uniform for the Royal Exchange, the first company to set up in Dublin. One of the things about it was they were very highly impractical, but very colourful uniforms. Because the majority of people were illiterate. So you had to have something that branded your company. So the Royal Exchange were the fellows in the pea green suits running round. The uh, Sun Insurance, who I've just flown past, were in blue. Different companies had different colours. As I say, totally impractical for firefighting, but very good advertising. <laughs> that would be an early fireman's helmet, uh, probably the earliest. That one has a history back to the Sun Insurance Company in Dublin in the 18th century. This is a fire mark, an example of a fire mark. Uh, an identical example to that can still be seen in Dublin. Um, for anyone who knows it, the Patriots Inn down in, in Plumeno has a Royal Exchange mark of that type on the side of the building. It's one of the very few buildings in Dublin that still has a fire mark. Again, this is a sun insurance mark. And again, it goes back to this idea that, you know, there's no point hanging a sign on the building that says this building is insured, but the sun insurance company people can't read. So you use a sun. You use something that will a visual imagery. Fire marks marked the insured building. So there was no question as to which building, if you own more than one, which was the insured building. The one with the mark was the insured building. It was also the first street advertising for the companies. They had this on the outside of the building, so in effect it was advertising for themselves. And the other thing about it was it was a form of um, how would you it? It was, it was for people to it, it showed off how well off you were. It's, it's a sign on the outside of the building showing that you are so well off, you actually have to insure the place. You know, it's, it's like having the Porsche parked outside. You know, it shows that you're, you're, you're doing fairly well. The first Irish company was set up in 1771. Um, this would be the Hibernian, that's one of their fire marks. People like the Latouches and Guinnesses were involved in that. The insurance company here, or the insurance market here, was starting to grow. And while the English companies were involved in the market, um, by this stage, the Irish business community decided that they should have a stake in it as well. So the, the Hibernian was the force of theirs set up. By the middle of the 19th century, it's estimated that there were 10 insurance fire brigades operating in Dublin, along with up to 20 parish engines. Since 1715, each parish had to have a large and small fire engine. And they did. Now, whether or not those fire engines actually worked, or anybody knew how to operate them, or they had any holes, or they could connect one to the other, that was entirely chance. Entirely chance. Uh, the corporation, along with these 10 insurance brigades, actually, there may have been more than 10. I've seen figures of up to 17 insurance brigades, but each brigade would be a one single fire engine brigade. Um, 20 <coughs> fire engines. The corporation had a, a, a brigade operating from White Horse Yard which is under civic offices now. It would have been in that area. It was an old waterworks depot and the waterworks department operated as a part-time fire brigade. And there was also a one pump brigade run by the DMP from the barracks of Kevin Street with an engine supplied by the corporation. So in theory, Dublin in the mid 19th century was well provided with fire engines and firefighters, but in fact, the situation was a disaster waiting to happen. This is a crude shank uh, cartoon of a fire in London, but it's probably fairly typical of the type of scene you would see at a, a fire in the sort of 18th and early 19th century in Dublin or in any city. Uh, various fire engines are at work, various insurance companies are at work, um, crowds are trying to help or not help or make off with anything that isn't held down as usual. Um, 
very, very messy system. As I say, the fire engines, the couplings wouldn't work from one engine to another. The people who could operate this engine couldn't necessarily operate that engine or have a clue how it worked. So it was, in theory, uh, we were well provided with um, with fire services, but in point of fact, it was it was a disaster waiting to happen. And the disaster did happen in 1861, in the, uh, or 1860, sorry, the 11th of November 1860, at a fire in the Kildare Street Club, where an assortment of engines that arrived couldn't work together and a number of lives were lost. Saving lives, incidentally, was not the duty of the insurance fire brigades. Lives were not insured, property was insured, and the lives were. Uh, they didn't carry ladders to help people escape from buildings. That was an entirely different crowd altogether. That was the Irish Society for the Protection of Life from Fire, who operated ladders around the city. And they were a charity. They relied on public donations to be able to do that. So as I say, it was it was a system where there were a lot of people doing the job badly. And what the city needed, it was decided, was a municipal fire brigade which would do the job well. The Dublin Fire Brigade was established in 1862, after much musing on the effect on the rates and other associated expenses. The question then arose as to who would lead this new body, and the position of superintendent of the Fire Brigade was advertised. The man chosen for the job was James Robert Ingram. Ingram was born in Dublin, but had emigrated to the United States in 1851. He worked there as a banknote engraver, and he was a voluntary fireman with the Niagara Hose Company, which he joined in 1853. Being a member of the Volunteer Fire Department, and it was a Volunteer Fire Department in New York at the time, was a step up in the social ladder. He returned to Ireland in uh, 1861. While he was in New York, he became a member of the Niagara Falls Company. As I say, it was a social thing. We pretty little about James Ingram, really. Um, his life has been lost to us. Like, there's one photograph to show you in a moment, and a particularly bad photograph, taken well into the age of photography. Um, we know that he had very strong connections through the Freemasons. The particular hose company that he was with was associated with a Freemason lodge in New York. And when he returned to Ireland, he carried his, um, it's called a demit. It's, it's like carrying his papers, his, the rank he'd achieved within that lodge, so that he could join a lodge here in Dublin at an equal rank. And from talking to the archivists in the Freemasons, we know that he was active within Freemasonry in Dublin for, for many years afterwards. Um, when he became chief, he took on the role of captain, and uh, that was common in UK brigades at the time, and in Dublin up to 1938, the, the chief of the fire brigade carried that honorary rank of captain, and the second in command then was the lieutenant. This is a helmet from the Dublin Fire Brigade, would have been worn from the initial days from the 1860s right through to 1938. Um, it's what they would have been wearing on the night of the... Uh, of the whiskey fire, that was your main piece of protection. This is Robert Ingram, and as I say, that's the only photograph we have of the man. At an age, you know, he died in 1882, so he was alive well in the age of photography, and common photography. And, uh, but he, he uh, maybe it was just camera shot. Again, that's another image of him, he's in the centre of this, that's the born of the Theatre Royal, or the first born of the Theatre Royal, Theatre Royal's a double book tendency born down. Is there in that again it's just an image of him and this would be but he's not in this particular one it just shows the brigade and the type of ladders for instance these streetscape ladders that were in use at the time that's a very early photograph of the Dublin Fire Brigade probably from the late 1860s now he took on as I say the role of captain his new brigade were housed at the headquarters in South William Street which is now I think the Irish Georgian Society you know that the woman right next to the power sports center there it was the Civic Museum for many years ago um, and they were also in the old, as it was called, the Fire Extinction Depot. Great names and things in those days. The Fire Extinction Depot at Point <coughs> Yard off Point Tavern Street. A total of 25 men were recruited and four manual engines and one steam engine were brought to equip the brigade. A number of supernumeraries of part-time firemen were also recruited, basically to operate the pumps and fires and to free up the men of the full-time brigade for actual firefighting. There's another piece of Ingram's... Um, Legacy to the brigade. The, the red shirt was very much a New York thing at the time, totally unlike anything that would have been worn in a British brigade. In fact, the only piece of equipment there really that would have been seen in other in British brigades, the brass mm -hmm. helmet. That's what a Dublin fireman looked like from 1862 to 1930, and that changed. An image of them 
going through the streets on one of the, the uh, steam driven fire engines of the day. It's a very interesting, I don't know if you can see it well enough now in that kind of clarity. It's an interesting painting in that the artist has painted the horses very, very well. Apparently painting the horses is extremely difficult. He's got that very close. Now, if you look at the firemen, they're all identical. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same face. They're actually, the same. we never had quadruplets in the job. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, he was extremely good at painting horses, but, you know, the human face didn't seem to be a, a strong point. The other fire engines in use at the time would have been these manuals. Now, when they were used, and the brigade's main resources would have been these, the steam pumps would have been the, the kind of heavy duty equipment. This would have been the standard fire engine. It had to be operated by up to 20 men hand pumping the engine. You wore through men very, very quickly doing that. It was very strenuous work. So the normal thing would be for the detachment of soldiers to be sent along. Sometimes civilians would do it. You just round up civilians. And interestingly enough, if civilians did it, they were given tokens which they could um, reclaim later from the corporation for their, their services. And traditionally, they also had to be paid because it was thirsty work. They had to, <laughs> first place in uh, they had to be paid in beer. So, no large pot, no whiskey at that stage, no, that's coming down the line, chase it. They, um, they had, a, yeah, that was a, a good supply of beer had always to be provided to the fellows operating the fire engines to keep them going. This would have been, at the time of the whiskey fire, this would have been, as I say, the main, um, the main fire appliances. There would have been two of these steam, Mary Weather, or uh, not Mary Weather, but John Mason steam driven pumps. Due to the actions of a new chief officer, well, new in 1938, most, if not all, of the brigade's early records were destroyed. It can be difficult to trace the records of early members of the brigade, but it's something I've been trying to do for many years. While sailors were given preference in Dublin, as in many other brigades, due to their being used to working at heights in the old sailing ships of the day, as well as harsh conditions and danger, and their familiarity with ropes and knots, a vital part of the firefighters' trade. Um, others who joined in those early years had other backgrounds. We had at least one veteran of the Crimean War, and we know there were two veterans of the Papal Army in the Italian War reunification. And these two men, uh, James, he's on the official paperwork as Rind, or Y-N-D, I think his name is Ren and it was just somebody misheard it and once was entered wrongly once that was then the record. Um, James Rend and Thomas Baines returned to Ireland from Italy and joined the Dublin Fire Brigade. Both also joined the Fenian Brotherhood and were involved in swearing Irishmen in the British Army Garrison in Dublin into the Fenians. Both they and their senior officer, known as the Pagan O'Leary, and I don't know if anyone's ever come across him, but he's just, he's just a fascinating guy. Um, Along with many of the Fenian Brotherhood in Dublin, were sold out by an informer, Pierce Nagel, in 1866 and came to the attention of the G Division of DMP. Rind, or Wren, managed to escape to America, but Baines was arrested and tried for treason. Now, this is the brigade's four years old at this stage. You know, two of, two of the guys, which is 10% of the force, have just been arrested for treason. One fellow managed to skip the country. The other lad got himself transported to Australia, the penal colonies, for 10 years. He spent five years, Bain spent five years in the penal colony of Fremantle before being released on licence on condition that he not return to Ireland. He went to New Zealand where his Fenian activities got him deported to America and lived in San Francisco until his death in the 1890s, still an important figure within the Brotherhood. I've seen a photograph of this man, he wrote a book which I cannot get, it was only self-published, it's not in any of the libraries here, it may be in the Library of Congress. But uh, to his dying day he was a Fenian and at one stage in his life he declared that he would never again have his hair cut until Ireland was free. <laughs> I have a photograph of him and he was he had hair down to his waist. Um, Ireland was never free in his time and the barber starved. <laughs> Ingram had a reputation, go back to Ingram, he had a reputation for sometimes unorthodox firefighting methods. In 1873, a ship, and this is a direct influence on the on the whiskey fire, in 1873 a ship called the Night Corps was drifting into Kingstown Harbour. There was panic at the prospect of the disaster that could occur as among her cargo was 50 tons of saltpetre, which was an ingredient, gunpowder. On her way into the harbour, she'd struck and sank a number of ships, but had come to rest in about 20 feet of water within the harbour. The fire brigade were requested, the Dublin fire brigade were requested, even though the fire was well outside the city limits. Having examined the burning vessel at great personal risk, Ingram made a decision. He decided, he asked the Royal Navy to send a gunboat along and put six rounds of cannon fire into the burning vessel beneath the waterline. The night force sank in the harbour, the fire went out, 
and she could be boarded at low tide and the ship and contents salvaged. In his report to the Waterworks Committee for the year 1875, Ingram lists the total strength of the fire brigade uh, three officers and 21 firemen, not including himself, so a total of 25. Firefighting equipment divided between the two stations was two steam fire engines like this and three hand pump engines. This then was the brigade which would face its greatest challenge on the night of the 18th of June 1875. I just have a wee drop of water myself before we start putting this fire book. At about 8 p.m. that night, sheets of flame were seen in the sky over the Cork Street, RD Street, Chamber Street area. A messenger was sent to alert the fire brigade at Point Harbin Street, and the brigade soon arrived to find Malone's bonded warehouse on fire. Malone's the main seat of the fire. There was uh, Reed's malt house next door, which was also involved, but it seems that Malone seemed to have been the, the, the main area of fire. What was unusual about it was the first indication that people had that the place was burning. It wasn't the usual, it's like a glow in the window and ring for the fire brigade. The roof collapsed and flames 20 to 30 feet high were coming out of this building. So this is a fully developed fire. This is a major fire. That area um, was part of what's been called the Golden Triangle of Distilling and Brewing in Dublin with Rose, Powers and Jemison's distilleries in the area as were Guinness and Watkins breweries. The area also contained many bonded warehouses holding spirits in bond for distillers and importers. Malone's is specifically mentioned by Ingram as the seat of the fire. Reed's malt house, which was in the adjoining building, was also burning. The fire had taken a firm hold before the fire brigade arrived. That's the general area. I don't know what extent you can make out there. We're talking about where, um, <coughs> uh, where the new Keating's whiskey distillery is, for those who know that area of the Coombe. It's in that, in that square there. Yeah, exactly, a new market. Um, as I said, the fire had burned for some time before the fire brigade arrived, and it had to have done to have built itself up to the point that it could, it could uh, burn to the roof and vent itself to open air. In his report on the fire, Ingram was unable to state it caused the fire due to the extensive destruction, which would have destroyed any evidence of how the fire started. On arrival, the brigade were met with extraordinary scenes as burning spirits flowed freely down the streets, setting other buildings in its path from fire. Within the building, the material that was held in barrels like these, in this kind of setting, floor to ceiling. Um, once they began to burn, as they sp as they burst open, the whiskey itself immediately went on fire. There was other spirits involved, as gin, various things as well, and, and various stages of immature spirits that was waiting to, to, to mature fully within the bond. As they arrived, this is pouring out the windows and doors of Malone's, out into the street, and forming a river of fire in the streets. On arrival, the brigade were met with extraordinary scenes. The burning spirits flowed freely down the street, setting other buildings in its path on fire. Fire spread in Chamber Street, Mill Street, and R.D. Street. Um, Malone's had held, according to newspaper reports, 1,800 punchins of whiskey, brandy, and wine. A punchin is a hierarchy of barrels within the whole kind of facility industry. A punchin is a particular type. That's as close as I could get for an image to it. Um, each puncheon uh, held 70 gallons of liquid. There was 1,800 punchins. By my calculations, this is 126,000 gallons of spirits born. The burning liquid was described in some newspaper reports as burning like streams of lava. And another newspaper, this is the scene in the area, the, the, the streets are on fire. This lava like flow is, is, is running through it. Uh, according to the Daily Express, the glow lit up the whole district around and the heat became terrific. The burning whiskey poured in torrents from the doors and windows of the burning pile and rushed down Mill Street and other streets of the locality in flaming and lava-like streams. The flames from the whiskey stream closed 20 and 30 feet in height. Among the scenes, several other human dramas were playing out. People rushed to save what little they owned from their homes before they were engulfed in the flames. There was a lot of tenant housing in that area. People had lived a hand-to-mouth existence. They literally, it was a matter of life and death to save as much as you possibly could. Others rushed to help invalids, and others uh, who needed to help the rapidly moving stream. Newspapers described the poor people rushing from their burning and threatened houses, mothers with babies at their breast, invalids tottering on some helping arm. Uh, apparently in one house there was a wake going on and the corpse had to be carted off as well before the, the, the house was starting to burn. At one point the flames threatened a nearby Carmelite monastery. 
this is actually referred to at the time in the newspapers as the miracle of the fire, that the fact that the Carmelite monastery was, uh, was nearly in, in danger. Um, the flames threatened this Carmelite monastery, a convent rather, but a change in the breeze blew the flames towards the row of houses instead. And this at the time, as I say, was described as a miracle. Now, what do you, the people who live in those houses, which are now being destroyed instead of the convent, I'm not quite sure, but I may not have agreed that it was a miracle. Um, scaffolding on the new wing of the Coombe Hospital, and again you have to think back at the old Coombe Hospital in that area. Uh, scaffolding began to form. It was wooden scaffolding at the time, of course. Firemen climbed onto the scaffolding and cut it loose before the flames were carried into the hospital itself. There were other lucky escapes. Watkins Brewery, another potentially rich source of fuel for the fire, was untouched. But in the area, the houses burned, the pub burned, warehouses burned, uh, as did a tannery, uh, which added its own pungent aroma to the fire. Animals, people kept animals. Even in the city centre, they, they had horses and donkeys for carting and for, for moving material around. A lot of people kept pigs and would sell them at, when they were mature, they'd sell them to a local butcher. Uh, and you could you could keep a pig cheaply because it lived on scraps and you could even be torn onto the street to scavenge. So you have these herds of horses who've been released and have been maddened by the, the smoke and the smell and the fire. You have donkeys running around the place, you have horses and pigs and some pigs being saved. The pig is probably more valuable than anything else to do. <laughs> Since its arrival at the scene, the fire brigade were forced to stand by, as putting water in the burning spirits would only help it flow faster. Ingram gave orders to block up the sewers. It would appear that some of the burning liquid had found its way via the sewers into the underground Puddle River and reports of loud explosions under the city streets were carried in the next day's papers. He also sent for support from both the DMP and the military, who both turned out in large numbers. Crowd control was a major problem, with thousands of people drawn into the area to see the fire. Some come for the excitement of a major fire, huge spectacle in its day. Huge, huge event. A lot of people come in to see that. Some were cold, but a strong smell of whiskey. <laughs> Ingram had his men assisted by the military dig up the streets in the burning whiskey's path. They tried to make banks of the rubble, paving stones, but in most cases the whiskey simply flowed through and continued burning. Ingram had another idea. He sent for the corporation vans to bring what was called ashes, manure, etc. to bank up the streets and stop the burning liquid. The streets of Dublin were regularly cleaned by the corporation to keep the amount of horse manure on them at a manageable level. Everything is, is horse drawn or, as I say, cards with donkeys or whatever, the white product of that is an incredible amount of manure, which has to be kept up the streets. The corporation are constantly clearing it bring it to depots where it's sold on to farmers as uh, fertilizer. Uh, in the days before the proper sewage system, as I say, it wasn't just horse manure. In the days before the proper sewage system, ordinary houses and tenements made use of what were called ash pits, where what was euphemistically termed night soil was deposited each morning. Uh, these were supposed to be cleaned out on a regular basis by the corporation or private contractors but regularly contributed to the squalor of the poorer areas of the city, especially after heavy rains. These were basically just holes in the ground where you emptied stuff into and hoped that someone would eventually clear it out. If it didn't, it simply just either soaked into the ground or got washed away by the rain. Uh, the third of the materials taken to the Liberties that night to help to block the burning whiskey was tan. Um, this is the leftover product from the city's many tanneries, and that particular area from there down to the Liffey, there were a lot of tanneries in that area. Tanning is a fairly uh, messy process. The tanning process involved skins being dipped and washed in vats which contained a mixture of uh, urine, dog feces, and animal brains. This was the start of the process. This is the good stuff. <laughs> and what we're talking about is the leftover product from this being brought, being dumped and then brought in to help fight the fire. So, like you're talking about an ungodly mess. Uh, the corporation carts began to move large quantities of the horse dung and other material into the affected area. Ingram had shovels issued to the soldiers and firemen who began to build dams of it across the street and to coat the burning area with it. As the burning whiskey hit the wet manure, it began to be absorbed and go out. The tide was beginning to turn at this stage. As the soldiers spread the manure, the fire spread in the streets could be controlled and the firemen could set their engines to work and begin to fight the fires in the buildings. The rivers of lava had been brought under control. Another problem, and not one which Ingram the fire brigade controlled by any means at the disposal had begun. 
thousands of rushed to the liberties from all over the city. Uh, from an early stage, it was clear that some had planned to benefit from the bananas of rivers of free-flowing whiskey. At an early stage, soldiers guarding some barrels which had been salvaged from Malone's warehouse had to fix bayonets to keep a chuckle the ground. <laughs> In the streets and alleyways around the scene of the fire, men and women began to drink the free-flowing spirits. Now, when I say the free-flowing spirits, this free-flowing spirits has now been contaminated by the locked-up sewers, uh, the horse manure, <laughs> the contents of the ash pits, and the leftovers from the tanneries. <laughs> but it was pretty strange, fair. <laughs> In the streets and alleyways, they began to, to drink the free-flowing spirits. People were gathering the raw spirits with every pot, kettle and jar available. Uh, you see some imagery from the Illustrated London News of that. Um, <laughs> Some were seen to take off the boots and scoop it up, <laughs> while others simply lay down and drank it from the ground and they actually collapsed into it in some cases. This was a poverty-stricken area of a poverty-stricken city. Dublin had none of the industrial great space of Belfast or cities in England or Scotland. It relied on the docks and on brewing and distilling for its financial life by the local government. The middle and upper classes had largely fled the city after the Municipal Corporation's Ireland Act of 1840, which had extended the ballot and for financial and political reasons a lot of people had decided to establish self-governing townships outside the city boundary. They were close enough to benefit from all the amenities of the city, they paid the rates to their own township, and they further started the city of funding. The poor of Dublin had little to entertain them, or distribute largesse. So the prospect of a free drink, or several free drinks in this case, certainly set off a mob reaction. Soon the streets were filled with drunken and often unconscious people. The police found themselves busy carting people to the hospital who were suffering from the effects of the illicit spree, the price for drinking the heavily contaminated spirits was heavy. The Irish Times destroyed people in the comb being found in the, uh, the Irish Times, of course, a beastly state of intoxication after getting their hands on the illicit whiskey. It carried a report on the death of one unfortunate man, William Smith, 21, who died after drinking the whiskey from his cupped hands until he collapsed. Apparently, from reports, William knelt himself down by the side of the road and just kept lashing into it until he actually fell into it and died. Eight men were carried to hospital in a comatose state to the Mead Hospital, 12 to Jervis Street Hospital, 3 to Stevens Hospital and 1 to Mercer's Hospital. These figures vastly underestimate the number who did harm themselves by drinking this unholy concussion. In all, 13 people died in the Liberty's Whiskey Fire, more than at any other fire in Dublin in the 19th century. This was the biggest fire in Dublin in the 19th century. It's the biggest fire in terms of financial loss. It's the biggest fire in terms of the, the area that's burnt and destroyed. It's also the biggest fire in terms of loss of life. What makes the death toll so unusual, apart from the large numbers, is that none of them died as a direct result of the fire. No one was born to death, or died from smoke inhalation, or from being shot in collapsed buildings. They all died from alcoholic poisoning. And a meeting in the Mansion House to organise a fund for the relief of victims of the fire, the Lord Mayor Peter Paul McSweeney, said that it was amazing that the death toll wasn't higher. <laughs> he went on to say, the time given for escape in some places during the progress of the fire was so short, I was apprehensive that some people would be left in danger in the garrets and cellars of the district, but on inquiry I was happy to learn that no life was lost during the great conflagration, apart from 30 people who had actually died, of course. Speaking of the deaths from drinking the spirits and the various pollutants used to help extinguish them, he said that the unhappy deaths could have occurred in, uh, this is a great excuse, this is, this is, this is Healy Racial, this is really good. He said, it would probably have occurred in any city where there was a tendency to indulge immoderately in drink. In the present case, the unfortunate victims apparently couldn't restrain themselves, as I understand, from drinking the burning food. There are two postscripts to the fire. While the brigade was highly praised for its work in the fire in the newspapers, it was wrongly reported that a Mr. Croft and some of the former waterworks inspector had been the one to make the decision to block the streets with the veneer. Captain Ingram was quick to put the record straight. Uh, in a report to the corporation, he said, I deem it necessary to report that there is a feeling among the officers and men of the brigade, owing to reports that have occurred, that on the occasion of the late disastrous fire, they did not take proper means to extinguish it. I beg to state that that which has been attributed to another corporation officer was done long before he appeared at the fire. I had given orders that the fire aired it, and sent the corporation cards to convey ashes, tan, manure, etc. And previous to their arrival, I had the streets dug up and the sewers stopped. The last piece on the fire concerns another piece from the paper in the immediate aftermath. 
the Irish Times reported that on the night after the fire, a dog ran through the open door of a house in Dominic Street. The animal was foaming at the mouth and appeared to be, in the words of the paper, suffering from delirium tremens. <laughs> from the up the whiskey. The dog crashed madly about the house, knocking over furniture, attacked the homeowner who fended it off with an iron bar. The dog then ran upstairs and jumped from an open window. In the words of the Irish Times, it terminated its existence. <laughs> <laughs> 143 years since the Great Liberty's Whiskey Fire. Perhaps we can mark it in some way on its 150th anniversary. New distilleries are opening in Dublin to complement those which have always stood here. And the city is once again a centre of the distilling industry. Perhaps somebody within that circle might arrange a small plaque at the site of Malone's warehouse to remember that awful night and the events that took place close to it. On the other hand, it's hardly a great advertisement for drinking whiskey. <laughs> Folks, thanks very much. Would have been American at the same time, and again, they would, they would possibly have telegraphed, but yeah. the word would have got them very. People talk about them throwing up within six to eight minutes at the land. Which is remarkable when you think that they're horse drawn vehicles that have to be, yeah. have to be put together and, and brought along. Uh, yes, two questions. Could you clarify the date again for me? Uh, the 18th of June, 1875. The second question is how long did the fire last? <coughs> like you were describing things there which would. In my imagination, would take hours and hours. And oh, hours absolutely! Through, yeah. it, went, it went through the night. It went yeah. through the night. It it spread through the area. I was only there on Thursday. Um, funny enough, with a film crew, a French film crew, who were doing a piece on uh, Dublin history, had picked up on this and wanted to see here, and we we're just talking about it. You can still trace the route of the fire. You can still go past Watkins Brewery, where. Because it was flowing downhill, it actually accelerated past the entrance to the, to the both the brewery and the, the the workers' houses beside it. But the warehouses, the tenements, the rest burned, and a lot of them would have had to be written off. That there, there was no sign of them, and the firefight effort would have concentrated on uh, factories, warehouses, places of value. To be sure. honest with you, an awful lot of the, yeah, an awful lot of the, uh, the tenements would have had to be just um, let go of their flames. Yeah. Where did they draw the water from? Uh, they had a street system in Dublin going back prior to the fire brigade, the old wooden water mains were, were on the streets, were on the streets rather. And in those days, prior to fire hydrants being installed, what you did is you would have somebody from the water works point out where they believed the wooden water mains to be. You'd lift the cobblestones and you dig a hole down to it. And when you unearth the wooden uh, main, you, you open it up then with an axe, you basically force the main, and as the, the hole filled up with water, you bucketed that into the fire engines and then spread it on the fire. Or just bucket it straight to the fire, depending on the, on the circumstances. Each time you did that, you wiped out a whole section of water mains so that had to be replaced afterwards. Which hence the reason that they, somebody invented fire hydrants. Where was Watkins Brewery? Uh, Watkins Brewery is on RD Street. If you go down, to what used to be the end of Cork Street. Do you remember Cork Street was a, was a key junction? And now we yeah. are, have yeah. all the little houses. Watkins. That's right, yeah. Well, well, if you, if you drive down Cork Street, you know Watkins is more or less gone. There's the remains of some of the offices on the right hand side, and you're driving through the what, what was the old brewery. It was demolished night way for the uh, the extension of, of Cork Street back in, when was that? Back in the, the 90s, I suppose. Yeah. Late 80s, 90s. It was an odd thing because it was a 1916 garrison, and uh, myself and man used to keep an eye because there was a there was a marker on it to show that it had been a 1916 garrison, and that disappeared about four years before the building was compulsorily required and not, um, which I think suited some people not to not to be reminded that it had a historic value itself. Yes, yeah, um, I recently done a visit around Teeling's uh, distillery there, yeah, and during that tour they explain that they actually can't, while they distill the whiskey in Cork Street, mm. or just off Cork Street, they, they actually can't, uh, I don't know what the, f the phrase is, cure it or age yeah, it, yeah. because since that fire, uh, all curing has to take, out, take place out in the country. So Tailings is actually matured somewhere in Mead. Yeah, there are, there are still some London warehouses around the world for a long time after. One of the things that changed was that I just scooped through a couple of uh, 
these here for me, there again, they're the, the fireman's helmets. That particular helmet there, uh, if you look at the design on the front of it, anyone who's a whiskey drinker will recognise it. That's from Powers. Powers. Uh, they have their own in-house brigade. Now, the way Guinness would always have had an in-house brigade from the 1700s. The like of Powers and the other whiskey distilleries set up their in-house fire brigades. Um, yeah, the Bondon, within, in the Bondon process, part of the spirit evaporates. I know the 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 was it the, the, the yeah, angel yeah, shared the gun, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I mean it's an inherently dangerous process. So it would be ideal to have it in somewhere that had a sprinkler system and had yeah. fire protection and the rest. But in those days, that certainly uh -huh. wasn't the case. Whatever whatever was available <coughs> was used. You was there a start on the There's no way of knowing because normally to, to trace back on a fire you go from the point of least damage to the point of most damage, and if you found that you found where it started. But you know, the whole area was basically destroyed. I mean, it was a blitz, it was, you know, there's no way you know. Yeah. 1875, there were probably uh, candles in use in there. Um, you know, again, it'd be pure supposition, but I mean, you know, could have, could have been anything. Rathman would over a candle. Yes? Two questions. Firstly, the what, what proportion of the investigations were carried out subsequent to the, the fire? And secondly, have you ever come any photographs of the taking of the aftermath? No, I haven't. And again, it's it's well in the age of photography. And the only investigations that would have been done would probably have been a police investigation which would have looked at whether there was a break in because no idea if that reports of reads. I mean the building itself didn't survive, so there would have been no evidence one way or the other. The only people who would have had a kind of vested interest really in investigating the fire would have been the insurance companies. And there would have been because of the size of it, um, <coughs> 570,000 litres of spirits, uh, it would probably have been divided between a number of insurance, no one company would take on that amount of risk. So they may well have investigated. But again, the place was gone, it was ashes. So there was no way of portioning that on it. Was there insurance payout? No idea. There had to have been. There had to have been. But the people who would have got the payout, I know somebody asked me that on so the people who would have got the payout would have been Malone's. They would have got a payout. Reeds, the, the, the Malthouse would have. The people who owned the tannery, who owned the warehouses. The ordinary people living in those streets would have got nothing. Would there have been a payout from the claim against the corporation? On malicious damages? Yeah. But the source of it, they couldn't prove malicious. Yeah, well, it's, most of it would have been corporation property. Yeah. You know, basically a lot of the tenements, a lot of what, a lot of what wasn't insured would have been corporation property anyway. So, you know, it would have affected the rate. Not that I, no, I don't think it did. I don't think there was any specific, it, it was the insurance people who were actually fucking the bill, really at the end of it. And there would have been charges for the police turning out, there would have been some small charges for the military turning out, but it would have been, you no know, shillings if there was a couple of quid involved. I know that the tenants are obviously going to get anything, but, uh, I would imagine these buildings would have been owned by at least some landlords who would have seen maybe uh, the chance to pick up the bar and would have to maybe uh, charge against the insurance companies or indeed against the, uh, the, the corporation. Landlords making a quick couple of homes in Dublin. Yeah, I'd imagine the And again, the landlord would probably have the place in short. Yeah. If, if any insurance company was not an insurance company, you know, what is, yeah. Your research has come up in No, no. Again, you see, a lot of the insurance companies that were in action at the time are long gone. Yes. Most of the insurance companies now are amalgamations of amalgamations of amalgamations. They tend not to have a huge respect for their own history in, in some ways in terms of keeping paperwork. So, you know, you would be going back to companies which haven't existed in a hundred years and hoping that the predecessor or the, the the present companies would have kept some paper they don't really to be honest. They were saying that there was um, two stations. Yeah, yeah. And it was in 1875, yeah? Yeah, from 1860. I know there was one down, and I don't know what you mentioned, you don't know, there was one in town down the street. Where was the other one? No, the, the, in, it, at this period, the two stations were St. William Street, which, you remember the old Civic Museum? Mm -hmm. so yes. Yeah, yeah. The basement of that was a fire station. Oh. The chief officer lived there, and the unmarried firemen lived there. And there were two fire engines in there. The other two fire engines were at what was called White Horse Yard, which was, as I said, under civic offices. It was in that kind of White Tavern Street area. Um, 
it was a waterworks depot, but two fire engines were there. Going back to the time of the waterworks, at one stage the waterworks were under the fire brigade on a retained basis for the corporation. But after 1862, it was all absorbed into the, into the new municipal brigade. But firemen would have kept their equipment there, and the firemen attached to that station lived in tenements in Cook Street. They would only have moved out of there in January 1914 to move to Thomas Street. That's when, when Tavern Street went. Yeah. But uh, the brigade headquarters had moved a couple of times up to 1904 when it went into Tavern Street. Um, that was part of the, the Chief Officer Purcell's redesigning of the Dublin Fire Brigade. Where he quartered the city and put a fire station in each quarter. So you Thomas Street, Tavern Street, up Thomas Street, and Dawson Street. Got to go to the 1890s. The Hines is a separate township. The Hines is one of these um, self governing townships. Oh, and like Pembroke, it had its own fire station and its own fire brigade, full time uniform men. Yeah. But uh, they operated totally independently of the fire brigade. Hated to live inside of each other, the other ones. <laughs> um, and Dublin Fire Brigade couldn't go to a fire in that Hines unless they were like And the Hines could not cross the canal. Of the last yeah, even though it had expired, it just was yeah. up there, it just couldn't have them. Even in 1916, they were into that. It was a matter of huge pride. Right? And when the AFD was into that mines, they took over. So I keep saying, it was part of that community for a long time. Uh, they took over the fire. It then began a double the fire and double the houses. You mentioned the fire brigade that are afraid for their work. Yeah. Um, did that encourage the authorities maybe to invest more heavily in the fire brigade and maybe expand it in the future, given that the city is going to be expanding as well? And there's a likelihood of maybe similar fires in the future? The, the possibility, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, traditionally in the fire service, and the Irish fire service in particular, um, after major fires of disasters, everybody takes a huge interest in it yes, until yeah. something else comes along and they're forget about it again. Um, Ingram was building. Uh, a system in Dublin. He was building a brigade. Mm -hmm. uh, this was 1875. They didn't really. They got it. They got a third steam fire engine a few years later. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that was it. Got, at the end of his time in 1882, the died in service. He died of TB, which was the biggest killer of the environment in the 19th century, mm -hmm. because they were living in tenements. Their business brought them in and out of tenements, mm -hmm. especially after 1898 when they took over the ambulance service. Um, they were in constant contact with. TB in a city that was really good. So, as I said, it was the biggest single killer of firemen in the 19th, 19th century and killed him as well. It was really, there was no huge expansion in the brigade. There was an expansion in that he built it from nothing to a, to a good working brigade in 1882. The chief that came in then, Boyle from 1882 to 92, basically kept things in place. The brigade didn't expand. It actually had its first deaths in service. Three men were killed in two separate incidents in this uh, control. Um, the, the brigade had stagnated, and then in 1892, Thomas Corson came in, who was probably the father of the Irish Fire Service, and developed Dublin into basically what, what to a degree, what it still is. You know, we've made it the, the, the primary rescue organisation in the country and poured resources into it. Um, invented a lot of fire. It was a great history for that man, but uh, he's a wee bit outside of her. Thank you. Thank you. No? I, yeah, was, sorry. Were there any lessons learned, i.e., um, did the fire brigade, you know, they had to be called out to a fire again with alcohol? Was there any special new procedures inserted, or was it just okay that that man Ingram had the initiative to, to do what he did? It was. I, I think it was. It was Ingram had this great capacity. Whether it was from his time in New York that he wasn't in the kind of high down systems that would have worked in other brigades, he you know he could think outside the box, like like the ship fire. When everyone else is wondering, you know, what they're going to do when Kingstown burns down, he basically has the ship sunk. So, you know, the fire's gone away now. No, there was no, it was such an unusual fire. It was a fire that was never, it was the biggest fire, as I say, in the 19th century. And though <coughs> it, it wasn't, there was no fire on that scale again until Eastern 1960. Um, the brigade didn't deal with anything on that kind of massive conflagration level. He was a brilliant firefighter, but he just didn't have the resources. I mean, they were relying on, on a very small proportion of the waterworks rate to run the fire brigade. And the corporation, <coughs> all local authorities don't like, you know, your fire brigade's the same as chimneys in summer. Nobody wants to pay for them until they need them. Was there any fire regulations in those days? Very, very basic fire regulations. Uh, a lot of it would have, would have been certainly very self-governing. The insurance companies uh, would produce maps 
I've seen, I think they're called code, C-O-A-D um, maps, and they would map areas of the city. I've seen one of the Dublin ones, uh, covered in Moor Street, where they would go in and they would, they would map the fire risks. So if you come to them and say you want to ensure number 123 Main Street, they want to know what's in 121 and 125 and what's behind you. So they'll send surveyors out and say, you know, that's fine, that's absolutely no problem at all, but there's a fireworks factory next door. And the guy at the back has a stable to restore his gunpowder and, you know, the fellow on the other side is a pyromaniac, so maybe we should sort of push his insurance up more than you would think on the face of it. That was a kind of self-regulating or a kind of self um, taking care of their own business within the insurance, but there wouldn't have a lot of... We've been very poor in terms of um, fire safety legislation. Although in those days it would have been British fire safety legislation. But even after 1922, like it's first really major bit of fire legislation in this country would have been the, the Fire Services Act 1940. And that was because there was a lot of unpleasantness happening over in Europe and somebody thought we should do something. Um. I, I think that most of the buildings in the area would have been either brick or stone that um, timber houses wouldn't have been allowed at that stage in, in, in the city. Would it? You would have been in, the, in other areas of the city, like if you, if you go up for the Tenement Museum, what's the street? Um, Henriette Street. Henriette Street. Street. Um, if you go to Henriette Street, if you go to some of these places on, on you know, Mountjoy Square, these are these are the big houses that have become tenements. You know, that had fallen down the social side of the tenements. There were never big houses in the town. It was a workers' area always. It was never a fashionable area to see. Those big houses weren't there. So, what you had in there was a medieval streetscape. And in some cases, even the medieval, the remains of the medieval buildings, which would be. And they found some evidence of this in Thomas Street recently with some of the work they've been doing. Houses that basically would have elements going back to the 15 and 1600s. Because if the whole thing fell down, They'd still go in and say, well, you know, there's masonry we can use, there's wood we can use, and it gets incorporated into the next building. But there wouldn't have been any kind of modern building. Now, the, the Lake of Malone's and warehouses and places like that, yes. Somebody pointed out, it was, again, I was doing a talk for a local history group down in the area, and we did a walk around, and someone did point out some brickwork on a wall there, which does show signs of having been involved in fire, whether it was that fire or not. But it certainly does show us all them that, that looks very much like it was scorched at one point. There was a lot of wood. <coughs> there was a lot of wood under the plasters in the old house. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's what happened <coughs> a lot. Yeah. When they, they, the people didn't realise there was wood under the plaster. <laughs> yeah. And the people might remember the strips going all along. Yeah. yeah. And they were they were they were really happy for it when it happened. Like I've done a bit of work done a small work on the corner of the custom house. I think. Uh, in, in 1921, because um, quite a few firemen were involved in the burning of the custom house because they were also IRA and citizen army members to help to plan the burning and carry it out. And one of the things that you find with the custom house is that in the aftermath of the fire, when they did survey it, they found some very, very shoddy building practices that had been used. The very when it was being built, the builder went bankrupt and somebody else stepped in to finish the job to cut a lot of corners. So, as you say, you had timber being used in lintels, but then plastered over to look like snow. So, um, you know, shoddy building like was around the 18th century, 19th century. Yeah, it was in the age, yeah. You said the Protestant churches had their own fire brigades. Yeah. How did they function and when did that practice cease? 1715, because they were the established church. Yeah. So, in 1715, they were asked to, um, well, by law, they were required mm -hmm. that each parish. And the city was divided. And basically the city was run by the, by the, by the parish vestries at that stage. It was only after 1840 that Dublin Corporation, which we think of as going back to the old gods time, it was only after 1840 and the Municipal Corporations Act that the, 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 the vote for Dublin Corporation was extended out among ratepayers. Um, and it began to take on a nationalist kind of tinge, which was one of the mm -hmm. things that led to the, the, the formation of the, the townships. Prior to that, in the 18th century, the parish vestries would have had a huge amount of say in the running of the local areas within the city. Now they're required, as I say, to have the two fire engines, which you can still see in, in Warburg Street, but not required to actually have operational fire engines or have anybody trying to use them. So some parishes would take it very seriously, would invest in decent engines and proper holes and train people. Others purely and simply um, bought something that looked the part and parked it so they, they were seen to obey the law in, in, in spirit at least. 
And when did that practice start for you? Well, the vestries lost their power in really, you know, in terms of the, the municipal government under the 1840 Act. Uh, we set up the corporations right, as, okay. as elected representatives. <coughs> Parish engines were still running into the 1860s until 1862 when the, when the Dublin Corporation took over. Now, oddly enough, Ingram was approached by a group on behalf of the Church of Ireland to offer them the Parish engines. But most of them have been in place since, since uh, 1715. They're 150 years old at this stage. <laughs> so uh, he, he politely declined. And, uh, <laughs> That's why we still have the one on Warwick Street, yeah. because basically they, they, they couldn't, uh, they never got around the trouble at all. Well, as you mentioned that there were ladders, to, after some other disasters in the city of Beneath, there were ladders in certain locations in the city streets. Going back, yeah, going back to the to the insurance times, you had this uh, Dublin Society for the Preservation of Life and Fire, whatever that was. The um, Preservation of Life. Yeah, there, there, there was all these sort of odd charities set up. Um, the Irish Society for the Protection of Life from Fire. Uh, the Society for the Preservation of Life from Fire were a different crowd. They got the medals if you say it's something that didn't actually give them money for doing it. Um, that crowd had wheel escape ladders dotted around the city. They were relying, not many of them, they were relying on collection boxes basically to, to, to survive. When the fire brigade took over, they put that on a more organised footing. And you had sentry boxes put in place and buildings hit Catherine's Church. Um, Nelson's Pillar, Ma mainly churches, Bank of Ireland, places that get uh, Leicester House, places that people would know. And a fireman had to stand through the night or sit in the sentry box with the, the wheel escape ladder. Now it took four people to operate that ladder to move it. It was on, the, on, on large wheels and it ran upright. Um, the, police, uh, the firemen were advised, if at all possible, to round up the MP members to help push the ladder. And if they couldn't find the MP members, the fifth members of the public, the reason being that the corporation wouldn't have to pay the MP men. But if they had members of the public, they went to the shilling or whatever it was, two shillings, pushing it out of the way. But um, it was a problem. Again, going back to the man I spoke about, Corsell in the 1890s, when he came in and the electric tram came into Dublin and the loop line bridge was built, these ladders couldn't operate any longer because they couldn't go under the wires. He'd have to drop it, move it under, and try and bring it back, which it wasn't designed for. So he, he invented a horse drawn turntable ladder, which is one of the horses that's kind of here. Sorry, I'm off the board right here. Good ladders. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, sorry, I've given up. Um, actually, uh, you may have answered it already. I just was thinking of the people in the tenements. If your tenement was gone, your bed was gone, your plates were gone, your saucepan was gone. Yeah. What happened? I mean, you, you did, I do remember talking to somebody once and they said, well, they ended up looking at the burnt out house and they, all they had was a cup and a plate. Oh, well, you know, what happened to them? If everything was gone, you were gone with it. There was no, you know, there, there, there was other than, other than charity. There was no well, there, sort of... There was no, oh, just... No. The, but there must have been quite a lot of people. Oh, there would have been, yeah. Been. With just oh, nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Only nothing. what they stood up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see, you see in the images, and I know we're laughing at them, and it's, you know, it's funny. Sorry, it's, it's a safe distance to be funny. But people running down the street holding it. That pig was... Oh, yeah. I was going to keep that family alive. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, there was no, no, there was nothing there for them, bar charity. Um, and, you know, charity in a poor city can be a very, a very cold thing. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I wonder what Stockwell is the biggest bar since then. City. Uh, I know, well, we, you, you go back like, from no, there. I just wonder what the data sense is. I'm trying to think now, another one of the powers as well. Nice. No, it's not, yeah. Nice. Um, no, you, you, the next big fires and the biggest fires that the DFB ever faced were the 1916 fires uh, from you know, 24 to the 29th of April in 16, you know, the whole center of the city point. Uh, then again, in the Civil War, there were major fires. Again, the upper end, the bit that they didn't burn in 16, but once you burn, it was still. Yeah, but in terms of those lights, the Sardis would be head and shoulders. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that was a very, that was a very contained thing. That was a gas explosion, or an explosion of gas cylinders. Uh, but, you know, the fire spread into gas and was in the exit in the basement. Which is the exit. One of the boys was Malone, wasn't it? Malone, Nugent, and McCarthy. That's right. So the very note in, um, 
That's heaven. That's the side by side. The right hand side of the commander in chief. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And there was a fireman on the roof who was from Clare. Um, uh, he was, let me see, what was his name? Potts. Uh, he was a great traditional musician. And he was actually on the roof, and you know, when the building collapsed, some, just one of these great things, he was actually going to the roof and stuff. Yeah, folks, if that's. Oh, sorry, just, uh, you know, the loss of whiskey was a serious matter and a serious amount of income and labour and yeah. the jobs. But the biggest loss that, that I am aware of in this country through fire was the records office in, uh, mm. in the in the four courts, yeah, yeah. Again, I've done some work in the customs house, and I, you know, I'd argue that people said that the customs house is over. I'd argue that the bus there because um, successive um, census returns in the course of the First World War have been pulled for for waste paper. People didn't have the same regard for all paperwork as we have nowadays. We we have the. You know the the the, the, the wealth and privilege to be able to sit back and do things like this. At the time, uh, they would have been saying they're simply taking up storage space. So a lot of the early census returns were actually put for in waste paper drives during the First World War. Most of the paperwork that was destroyed in the custom house was legal documentation. Probably the biggest loss in terms of genealogy or whatever genealogy. was the paper that was being gathered, all the paper that was being gathered for the new Northern Ireland state yes. was gathered into the custom house because it could be brought across and sent by train to Belfast. So that apparently caused huge problems there for years afterwards, that, you know, in terms of um, inheritances and so forth, because a lot of that paperwork had been lost. Yeah, the four courts, again, it's, it's uh, a huge amount was lost there. But you know, it's the chicken and egg thing. Was it was it the people who took over the forecourts or the people who fired eighteen pounders from across the street into it? No, it's, it's an argument I wouldn't get into. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lars. No, that was no, excellent. No, no, no. Great loss of life before we had had in Pierce. What year was that? 14? 36? 36, yeah. 36. I wonder the chaps there uh, are you, are the son of one of those lads. Had an awful job to live the rest of his life. I, I met him on several occasions down the road. Living with the fact that his father was a great hero of the, of the Dublin Four Brigade. And his whole life, he had this huge burden placed upon him, like trying to live up to the dad, who also was a member of the IRA. Oh, the the Bowman's Mills Garrison. Bowman's Mills Garrison. And that was very oppressive on this chap all his life, which gave him severe mental problems and, and alcohol problems throughout his life. Uh, he. He, he died a bachelor there in the cellar gardens in England. Robert Malone. Robert Malone. God Meantime, folks, remember, put your phones back on uh, or take them off so in case you get into trouble for missing phone calls, etc., as so I normally do. <laughs> Donation box there at the back of the hall, which is the means of financing a society going forward. All of you are members. Your attendance here tonight makes you members of the society.